celebrate uh, this session. Uh, but before that, let me announce that uh, the registration is now also possible for the uh, last two sessions already uh, of this uh, webinar series. And there's one next week uh, by Giuseppe Fayola and Tim Schwane on grassroots innovation. And then we will end in two weeks with a, a policy round table on mission oriented innovation policies. Um, so yeah, let me now hand over to uh, Sean uh, to start this session. Thank you. Thank you, Thun. Um, um, it is definitely my pleasure to be moderating the session today. I am a research scientist at EAVOG uh, and a guest assistant professor at Utrecht University. I think we have a very important and interesting topic ahead of us today, um, presented by Dr. Lakshmi, along with her colleague, uh, Dr. Uri Hansen, focusing on transnational linkages, uh, especially on the Sino-African relations, focusing on the energy transition in East Africa. So I think this is essentially a very important because China is not just emerging as an increasing global exporter, but also with increasing physical pre uh, presence in other global South countries, such as in Africa. But more often than not, uh, than not, we tend to focus on the success stories and not so much on other kinds of consequences that come along with this. And in this case, when China starts transferring the turnkey expertise into uh, the sector in East Africa. So um, we have Lakshmi, uh, who is a currently a postdoctoral researcher at uh, UNEP at um, DTU, which is the Denmark Technical University of Denmark. And she is currently a postdoc, but she has done a lot of work particularly on this topic during her PhD. And she has brought an, a, a, a work experience in the areas of technology diffusion, market strengthening, community development, and impact evaluations. She has undertaken field work in India, Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda. She will share with uh, us her joint work with Ulrich, who himself is a senior researcher at uh, DTU as well. And Ulrich has done uh, extensive work in international technology transfer, upgrading in global value chains, R&D, innovation, and diffusion, focusing in developing countries. So uh, of course, we have a uh, Professor Mark Swilling joining us as well, who is a distinguished professor of sustainable development. Um, he will be discussing on the presentation by Lakshmi. And, and um, he, uh, Professor Mark Swilling has uh, extensive experience, especially on the topic of just transitions and, and also on governance related uh, issues in African context. So um, without further ado, I, I would like to uh, get the presentation started. Um, before that, um, just a reminder to our participants, if you have questions, content related questions, please post them in the Q&A function in the Zoom room. And if you have technicalities related question, please post them in the chat in the Zoom room as well. So we will have 20 minutes of presentations by Lakshmi uh, and then about five to 10 minutes uh, of discussion by uh, Professor Mark Swilling. Uh, and then we could have some short response from Lakshmi to, to Mark, uh, probably joined by Ulrich as well. And then we will pick up uh, questions uh, from the floor. So Lakshmi, um, please go ahead. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Shan, uh, and thanks everyone for joining today. Thanks also to the organizers uh, for inviting me to this interesting webinar series. Um, I have enjoyed listening to the previous uh, webinars and uh, uh, I'm also honored to have Mark Swilling uh, today uh, uh, for the discussion and um, thanks so much for the introduction. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, transnational linkages and these cross-border resource flows, uh, more importantly, the global local um, encounters, um, as I put it, and how they influence and shape transition pathways. And uh, before diving into the core topic, um, I would just like to briefly contextualize this work within the broader transitions literature and the GOST focus area. 
Um, and obviously this is putting a lot of, uh, I mean, the, uh, I'm just very broadly putting a few points here and there are obviously extensive um, literature as well as um, sessions and webinars on each of these individual topics and subtopics. Um, and but just to indicate that, I mean, inherently within the transition processes and innovation systems, there's always been this angle of global and national um, and, and this whole multi-scalarity aspect. Um, it's being viewed from a scalar lens, when, whether it's about explaining uh, why innovations take place where they do or how um, specific transition processes uh, are being uh, created or diffused in specific localities or how ideas and policies travel or how industry formations, industry clusters take place, regional changes, industrial structures. Um, and, and a lot of there's a lot of this uh, multi-scalarity already inbuilt into the transitions literature at a very meta level, at a very macro level, uh, understanding of systems and networks and diffusion patterns and industrial formations. Um, and, um, <clears throat> And within that, this uh, within the subset of the geography focus, scholars have been experimenting, also exploring concepts and frameworks. For instance, the specialized uh, niche model proposed by Sengers and Raven that try to look into um, the space and place sensitive perspective on niche development, in this case, the BRT as an example, and how these global ideas and diffusion networks then entangled into specific localities or how they get embedded. Uh, around the same time, we also saw this parallel paper, paper from Anna Vizorek, uh, who wrote this um, interesting uh, uh, exploration of transnational linkages to highlight niche experiments and how they're embedded in these uh, cross-border flows, particularly knowledge, capital, technology, but also movement of actors um, across different geographical locations. Um, these papers are also the other dimension of it is they were set quite a lot in India, Thailand, Asian economies, and a lot of research has been focused on niches and how hotspots have been uh, created and how they are uh, produced. Um, but, but we still see a greater focus on the socio-spatial uh, dimensions, like um, even in the review by Hansen and Koonen, um, they highlighted that um, beyond the kind of economic geography focus, if one also looks at other aspects of this uh, uh, human geography dimensions as well and the relational dimensions as well, analyzing the processes of these um, kind of uh, flows uh, requires that more attention is given to dynamics of agency and power, but also the practices of governance on the ground and also to pay emphasis on the social interactions between actors. Uh, and how space beyond this kind of uh, physical uh, concept can also be interpreted rather as a set of relations that, that are continually made and remade through agency and politics. And, and uh, around this period, we also saw the overlapping calls on the focus on actors and politics uh, within the transitions uh, network. And what the relational uh, aspect uh, brings forward also is the, the the shift needed from this broader macro focus to a micro focus where you where one can uh, kind of inspect these uh, varied set of actors their interactions and the uh, politics that unfolds as a result uh, but it also entails this more finer grained analysis of how transitions are innately shaped by the context in which they're produced and um, but bringing specific people and places to the foreground and how they're innately tied to the localities. Uh, and just to say that some of this was informing uh, my PhD research at that point a lot about the transnational actors and linkages and these flows. Um, and I, situ I, I did uh, uh, my research in um, East Africa, particularly focusing on the energy transitions and solar PV, which is very inherently embedded within these global flows and networks. And this kind of an approach was very inbuilt into the entire research work. Um, and I won't go into individual papers, but like looking at transnational actors and the solar PV transition in Uganda, but also looking at these ideas of policy mobilities and how policy ideas travel across from Germany and how they get embedded in Uganda uh, and within Rwanda, looking at how um, 
different international and local actors together enable these um, niche projects to take off. But for today's talk, I'll uh, focus more on a recent article that that we try to look at these finer grained uh, micropolitics and negotiations among the Chinese and Kenyan actors as a large scale solar PV project uh, unfolded on the ground and uh, also tried attempted to find ways to con contact conceptualize and uh, generalize it. Um, so at the very outset, as I mentioned, uh, I mean, the solar PV development is very global in nature. The manufacturing of uh, the systems mostly take place in specific regions in China and Germany, US, India, uh, whereas the diffusion is a lot more global in nature. Um, and within East Africa, uh, I mean, within Sub-Saharan Africa, Kenya has been a front runner in the uptake of PV, especially off-grid decentralized form of solar PV, but also uh, now increasingly the larger scales of uh, solar PV, utility scale. Um, and as scholars have pointed out that in the power sector, we also now see this additional dimensions of rising powers in Africa, mainly referring to China, India, Brazil, um, and, and with that revealing new sets of uh, dynamics that, that are emerging as, as a result. So we zoom into the first large scale solar PV project in, Indi uh, in Kenya developed and built entirely by the uh, Chinese as a sort of a bundled package comprising of the uh, province representative making a deal with the Ministry of Energy in Kenya, along with the Rural Electrification Authority in Kenya, and the project involving a concessional loan from the Exim Bank in China, uh, whereas the province is state-owned enterprise doing the entire EPC uh, and also leading uh, initial a phase of ONM, the operation and maintenance, and EPC, I mean the engineering procurement and the whole construction of the project. Uh, and obviously Chinese uh, suppliers for the actual equipment um, um, in terms of panels and batteries, um, and also several Chinese employees on the ground. So we mainly analyze the period when the actors are, uh, most of the engagement is happening during the construction period most of that's that's when the interface is the most because in the operational phase of the project um, it's then boiled down to very few people on the ground doing regular maintenance works uh, so the project timeline we mostly focus on is from the inception to the construction and till the commissioning period of, of it um, yeah but before, I mean, as we embarked on this, the, uh, it was also important to look back at the Sino-African literature because there's a lot of history and baggage associated with that, uh, despite uh, there being very few renewable or now more increasing renewable energy projects in which China is investing. There's obviously the Chinese investment and Chinese engagement with African countries uh, goes back way back in the history. And a lot of the literature is focused obviously on resource extraction, on large infrastructure building, on aspects of exploitation, on transparency, enclave characteristics. So it was also important for us to look into and tap into that uh, aspect of the literature. Uh, and, and then we try to enter into how Chinese investments have been growing in the renewable energy sector, which scholars have already indicated, but a lot of research still focuses on large hydropower uh, projects. Um, and the other problem has also been uh, um, to get more empirical data, to get more on the ground data, because a lot of the research also focuses on macro data, macro statistics, aggregate level patterns. Uh, and the other criticism from the Sino-African literature itself that has highlighted is this limited focus on the local agency and the African actors or treating them as a static identity and treating them as passive uh, recipients uh, of this um, engagement and so-called co cooperation. Um, so uh, the other one thing to mention here is the binary in the literature is quite heavy in the sense that the global powerful exploitative actor being China and the passive recipient being Kenya. Uh, but the other set of voices, which uh, is not so much in the academia, but in the media and gray literature is that the African government, so the Kenyan government is overly optimistic about Chinese en engagement and valuing their this uh, partnership as a comes with this no strings attached way of offering loans, concessional loans, 
um, as opposed to the the Western counterparts and their relations. Um, so, um, so for this paper, we use this concept of frictional encounters where we draw on um, eth ethnography and global glo global interconnections uh, literature and uh, also look into how we can integrate these different aspects um, and, and overlapping fields and concepts and bring together. Um, so whether it's the, the transition of PV or it's specific kind of multiscalarity, but also the inherent power dynamics that, that Sino-African literature indicates along with this whole dimension of developmental implications and political economy. And we, we try to find a certain concept that could resonate and bring together some of these uh, overlapping fields. And, uh, um, and so the focus of the concept is on frictions and the way it understands is frictions as a process triggered by conflictual encounters between, in this case, Chinese and African actors as the project is developed. Uh, and the concept and, and this tries to break away from these preconceived identities, uh, but also helps to focus on these micro level interactions and what comes out of it. Um, and frictions have been attributed in the literature to different uh, uh, different uh, rationalities, I mean, to different class positions, lack of trust, new liberalism, casualization, etc. And the fact that it these frictions may have a certain unpredictability in the way what responses they yield, whether it's compliance, compromise, etc. Um, so it's the focus is not so much on what, how, and why frictions arose, but rather the engagement is how things. Um, um, sorry, I said that wrong. The focus is on what, how, and why frictions arose instead of how things should have been or more normative uh, position. So I'm jumping into this very briefly. Uh, so in, in this case, we look at the project development period, the project construction period, um, and identify where most of the frictions took place. And that's mainly around these two types, which is around the local employment aspect and around the local community development aspect. Um, and I have to admit, I'm trying to squeeze in a lot of the micro process aspects into a few highlights here. Uh, uh, for obviously the sake of time. But what we see during the project is, uh, unlike previous claims, the Chinese EPC company actually employed mostly uh, Kenyan workers, or nearly 85% during the construction phase. However, a majority of these were low skilled and some semi skilled sourced from major towns. Um, the absolute numbers, despite of this, were very low because, especially when one compares with an equally sized 55 megawatt project in another locality, and that's because the entire focus was to make it very capital intensive to have, uh, to have very to do un to finish the project within very tight timelines, uh, which is what the EPC was working with. So, so the efficiency focus also brought the the number of labors and the em uh, employees down, uh, which led to this misalignment of expectations versus reality, because from very early on, the official's version was, and this is Ministry of Energy records, uh, Rural Electrification authorities recording and mentioning out loud that this would create so-and-so a thousand jobs, two thousand jobs. Whereas as the project kind of started to, as the construction began, the actual numbers seemed extremely low. At the peak was 250 to 300. Um, but also that this uh, workforce was very, uh, I mean, it entailed casual workforce. It entailed very less additional skill building. Um, um, and, and the other dimension, which doesn't get mentioned too often is even though, uh, so there, there was still a significant proportion in the highly skilled workers of Chinese employees, but a lot of these Chinese employees uh, and workers were already working in large infrastructure projects in North Africa and West Africa. And they were basically being recirculated among different projects. So not a clear direct import from China per se, as some of them have al already been living for almost a decade with their own set of uh, vulnerabilities as well. Um, 
and and obviously there are there are these different perceptions and different kinds of notions that d- different actors are also holding um, whether it's in terms of uh, the local pastoral communities feeling a certain uh, exclusion and alienation or whether it's the chinese managers finding it difficult to work in this particular locality or the uh, manager feeling that there are these uh, resistance created unnecessarily or constantly uh, asking for work but not really showing up etc um so the project entails uh, pastoral land diversion but that's not really a private land it's a community land uh, which is interested then with the county to uh, to kind of find a way to compensate it either through community development activities or through legal uh, applications to the uh, rights to the land etc but a lot of this uh, identification of how it would be compensated or what would be the uh, ways of uh, disbursements etc that entire process remained unresolved even after the construction was over and the project was put on site so that that remained unresolved there were a few initial issues around land which were circumvented because certain parcels entailed ancestral land etc but those were circumvented negotiated and uh, res- resolved uh, there was intention to contribute towards local development activities as part of an epc budget from the very beginning uh, yet a lot of that did not really take off way into the construction phase uh, further there was there were a lot of iterations around what the development activities would entail um, and and there were these accumulating frustrations from the fact that there wasn't enough employment and there wasn't enough uh, development activities and that there wasn't obviously any clarity on the uh, legal compensation for the community land uh, which eventually also led to um, uh, local mobilization and opposition to the project for a brief period there was also uh, an attempt to break the boundary wall and there was a local protest expressing dissatisfaction um, and uh, which eventually led to the rural electrification agency intervening um, and negotiating and promising formal employment contracts during the operation phase but also expediting development activities meanwhile so the rural electrification authority is a is a national level uh, agency and this project is being implemented in the garissa county so there's a county gov- government the local government and and meanwhile there was there's already this reassertion of power or a push back from the local county because they were uh, restarted the negotiations around what the community development activities would be um yeah so so having gone through these uh, different kind of frictional processes and uh, encounters um and and uh, we tried to kind of generalize what we found a bit to to see to step back and see how do we understand these trigger points how do we understand how it escalated or deescalated or how different sets of actors responded differently to it so at the local community level they mobilized they formed a committee they started negotiating on what would be the terms of the community development activities or the fact that for employment they want formal contracts at the local county level they were renegotiating the um, the specifics of the development activities at the national level there was they they were barely present on the ground so a lot of the locals were constantly encountering the chinese employees where there was a full communication dead end in that sense so there were also these fears of perhaps i mean the the um, the chinese uh, employees or workers taking over the area or the fact that the absence of the kenyan government was um, was also in to some extent instigated um, in this fear uh, so we tried to generalize a few of those to see the different responses but also the the process overall that it went through in terms of the emergence escalation and then the deescalation that was done to solve negotiate acknowledge some of the issues address them and then ensure that uh, 
the rural electrification has a full liaison manager full time on the ground so there's a one kenyan representative at least to communicate if there are any issues to be uh, uh, talked about um, so the overall obviously what we're talking about are the core benefits because the ultimate aim of the project was to bring in that sustainable energy mix to bring in more solar pv into the mix uh, to improve local infrastructure to to add to the local employment to also hopefully in future trigger local industries um, uh, but we are obviously also focusing on these core benefits of such projects because that's very in kind of inherent to these contexts uh, there was there were actually some positives in terms of the the total numbers of employment or the fact that there was a local consultancy firm em, uh, engaged in the very initial periods during the project drawings and blueprints but it's important to s understand that this was a heavily Chinese model in the sense that the the very fact that it had these tied financing agreements it circumvented the regulatory instrument of the feed-in tariff which was in place for all other projects but went for one-on-one -on -one negotiation the fact that it was a full turnkey which entailed only chinese um, contractors and subcontractors it had full tax waivers um, um, and by default the institutional arrangement and this arrangement in itself had little scope for local uh, spillover effects um, and and there there are some policy implications in the sense that the government could have national governments could have taken a lot more uh, kind of deliberate role in uh, ensuring more local content um, and and could have involved more domestic institutions in the entire process at different stages. Uh, and, and when we reflect back at how this concept actually helps us, I mean it's a micro level process perspective. It it just it's more of scratching the surface of this black box of how what really happens on the ground and how these different actors engage and interact uh, but also it allows for the framing of discontent more explicitly also as an inherent pa part of the change process um, it informs uh, us on in ways in which the agency is exerted negotiated but also beyond these identities of just global and local and different shades of the global uh, because the Chinese workers, if you take as an example, are also just stuck in those four walls where they fear going out, whereas the local communities fear getting in and this project wall kind of becoming this uh, dividing factor and creating these existential vulnerabilities that I call. Um, and obviously different shades of local, uh, some trying to bring in their vested interests into it, some trying to uh, just ensure that the project is done on time, etc. And what this brings focus to is that energy transitions obviously is opening up opportunities for positive developmental implications, or at times it's maintaining status quo, or at times it's reinforcing further inequalities. And, and this kind of a lens helps us to see which of these are happening on the ground, but also offers insights into this uh, local agency beyond the uh, simplistic uh, binaries. When we, ref when we step back even further in terms of how does this really link back to the, the geographies, I mean, does it really explain the unevenness of geographies? Does it explain something about the meta factors? Because ultimately, it's a very single project focused, and it still uh, upholds the fact that the PV transitions are explicitly transnational. And the implications here are a lot more in the development domain. Uh, and and a question that opens up is is it also a new sort of extractives but there are some myths that are also getting busted in some form um, it's i think one point here to note is when initially we read all of these studies about resource flows and knowledge networks it's always put in a very positive neutral light that these diffusion processes are inherently very good i mean they're they're obviously leading to more innovation activities they are leading to more uh, enablement of transitions and niches and there's ultimately a trickle down effect that's happening to specific regions and localities that benefit but also there are it involves processes of contestations it there are these inherent it's not a level playing field um, and there are these inherent power dynamics that that 
get coming to the forefront when one takes such a uh, looks at such a lens but also it kind of reinstates the the, the, the global the the power that um, uh, China's growing importance has uh, on transitions in Africa and how that ultimately unfolds and manifests in specific ways. Uh, but also a thought about, in this case, it's it's entirely, uh, even the specific assets, I mean, the extraction is not of anything. Okay, what I meant to, I'm also trying to articulate is it's complete import a, a, a project fully parachuted in from a different geographical context entirely, whether it's in terms of finance, in terms of technology, in terms of uh, some employees and labor to a completely different locality, um, which um, does it necessarily trigger a new set of path creation? Does it necessarily trigger new industrial um, structures? I'm probably throwing more questions than answering here, but on that note, um, thank you very much. Thank you, Lakshmi, for the very interesting and insightful uh, presentation on the topic. So, um, Mark, uh, if you are already ready, um, please uh, unmute yourself and share your comments or questions. And if you have slides, you can also share your screen. No, I don't. I don't have. All right. Uh, I don't have slides. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks very much uh, for the for the excellent uh, presentation and for the really interesting papers which I've circulated to my group here at uh, the Center for Sustainability Transitions in at Stellenbosch. Uh, we're doing some very similar kinds of investigations. Um, I think what 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 I what I find uh, very useful about the the phrase uh, frictional encounters uh, and the and the and the literature that you that you bring together uh, is that it's it's inherently relational. It's an inherently relational concept that kind of, as you say, breaks away from the binaries, and that is absolutely critical uh, and speaks into a much wider. Uh, impasse in, in development thinking on the continent as a whole, which is also structured around these kinds of binaries. And, to, and, and, you, and you, use, uh, you use the phrase uh, relational dynamics and, you know, which, which, and how one studies uh, relational uh, dynamics um, becomes, becomes the key issue. And I think you've, you've shed a lot of light on uh, you know, using your kind of qualitative interviews, your focus group uh, discussions, which were obviously very well put together uh, to kind of bring into relief uh, these relational dynamics, which have, a, uh, which, which have a real impact in terms of the outcomes. And with, with DTU, we've just recently finished a, a project um, uh, looking at the auction mechanism in the South African context, and I wrote up uh, Ulrich was involved. I, I wrote up the the synthesis paper and tried to use an institutional work uh, approach uh, because I was I was quite fascinated by across many different papers written by people from many different uh, traditions, including economists. Uh, there was a continuous reference to agency and the choices agents were making. Uh, in the context of these relational dynamics. And once you start thinking that way, uh, what, what then starts to happen is that you cannot assume a priori from the structural configuration what the outcome is going to be. Um, so, I mean, you've selected a case which is like an extreme, it's an extreme case of, you know, as you say, parachuting in a, an entirely uh, pre-baked, Prepackaged solution from one context into into an African context, and all the ideological hoo-ha that goes along with that to justify that by the the lo local uh, by by the by the Kenyan government or uh, you know in, in, in across Africa in amongst African governments, but 
you, you, uh, what I really appreciated is the way in which you're trying to break away from the, 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 the victim, the African victim, African passivity uh, narrative, which is reinforced by the narrative of parachuting in. The parachuting in, by definition, uh, uh, implies that uh, the local agents really just oiled the wheels um, uh, and, and really goes against what you're trying to look for, which is, you know, how has, how has local agency influenced these relational dynamics? And in the South African context, I, I mean, I went into that, into that project with DTU with a very negative view of multinational corporations as the transmitters from the outside to the inside. Uh, but the, 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 the work, the, the, the case study work that was done during the three years showed that actually multi, multinational en engagements with the South African context resulted in quite significant uh, shifts of power and expertise and capability uh, in favor of the South African context in a way which was much more productive than state attempts to build South African owned companies to seize control of the, of the value chain. Uh, and it was really a story of, of agency, uh, of institutional work, uh, which doesn't predetermine the outcome. So I think that this is a very, very productive uh, space. One of the questions that I would raise is uh, frictional encounters and, and, and the way it's, it's used mainly uh, implies kind of bad things, uh, you know, conflict and you know all the other things that 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 that, that you list, uh, but I'm I'm, and maybe influenced by the, this this work that we've just done with you and on South Africa. I'm interested in frictional encounters that actually have productive outcomes. Um, so 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 if you, maybe to use a slightly different uh, met metaphor, you know, in the in the world of ICTs and smart cities, there's the concept of frictionless. Uh, cities um, and um, and and the frictionless cities is is a kind of recipe for stupidity. Uh, I mean, it's through friction, through rubbing shoulders, it's through resisting, it's through contesting that we learn. So a lot depends on your theory of learning. Um, and so, if friction by definition, if, if if frictional encounters is used as by definition something like negative and they're going to be inevitable losers in the in the traditional structuralist uh narrative where you know losers are always losers and winners are always winners and therefore we can never win um a hard, how do how do how do frictional encounters actually maybe result in a multiplicity of losses which accumulate over time into learnings which in turn set the basis for winning uh um I, th I think it was uh, uh, Apadurai who wrote a, who wrote an article called "Let a Thousand Failures Bloom," uh, and 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 you build capacity for uh, winning battles in the in the in the future. So it's through failure, quite often, that uh, we can learn. We don't necessarily learn, but if we turn failures into confirmations that inevitably losers lose and winners win, then nothing then you know friction becomes pointless. Um, uh, but a friction is seen as a way of, of learning and how that learning is captured, and that's where researchers play a critical role, then it becomes a very fruitful way of thinking about um, the facilitation of these engagements. And that's my last comment is uh, your reference to how the REA parachuted in to kind of save the day. Um, I would absolutely love to know what their facilitation technique was. What was their method? And we're doing some of this work in Cape Town around the water crisis of the uh, day zero and how that was resolved and the role of an organization called the Economic Development Partnership in facilitating. And we're actually analyzing the methods used to facilitate basically friction and engagement and learning that resulted in a halving of water consumption in a couple of months without any technology solutions. So it's it's. It would, I'd love to know whether the REA learned anything from this experience, which they then, which kicks back into building capacity to continue to intervene, uh, rather than seeing conflict as an exception, presume that it's a norm, uh, and have the capacity to facilitate 
uh, the learnings and capture those learnings for the sake of, of winning battles in the future rather than always losing. So yeah, this is my comment. Yes, thank you for the very good uh, comment. So um, Lakshmi, if you could take a, a few minutes um, to respond to Mark, um, and then we will pick up questions from the floor. Sure. Um, thank you so much, Mark. I, I, I think those were some really great points and that really nicely summarizes um, uh, the presentation. Um, let me start with your first question. I mean, I, I totally understand uh, that uh, the frictional encounters and, and the word, the term friction has this uh, negative connotation um, by, by default inherently. Um, but in fact, when, when we reviewed a lot of the China Africa literature, there's this, the encounters as a term gets used a lot. In some cases, frictions, but encounters and, and uh, set of studies that were also done on what they term as conviviality, but mainly looking at encounters which produced also kind of positive developmental benefits or kind of gave or expanded the scope for local agency to stretch their bargaining power. And, and when we also started looking at it, even though the term frictional encounters has that negative connotation, the idea is that what frictions produce could be not necessarily negative it could be it could have elements of positive it could have elements of negative it could have elements of just maintaining status quo um, and and in this case uh, we definitely saw areas of the so-called not just leading to negative outcomes but learnings in the sense that it did i mean uh, and and i'm connecting this to your third question on rea and the rural electrification agency and how they came mediated and what the overall learnings were and what i was surprised to find is that rea actually saw themselves as a, 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 in a very vulnerable position um, the key thing to mention is that the rural electrification agency is a policy body so they don't have any experience haven't had any prior experience in actually project support project development and kind of working closely with epc so all of this was a new ground for them but they were getting comfort from the fact that this is a government project so there was in somewhere an understanding that this because it's a government project it's a public purpose project it won't really have so much of resistance unlike what one sees in kinan gop wind project in kenya which obviously got stalled because of a lot of resistance, but there was this, uh, Rhea worked with this feeling that there won't be resistance. And when they started engaging and they ensured that they engaged with the communities early on, I mean, before the project construction stage and uh, they took them on board, they were very actively working with the local county and they never expected the local county to also push back or to come in with their own vested interests and to renegotiate the terms of the developmental activities or stretch the EPC budget for the community development activities and uh, also in 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 that in involve administrative uh, works for the county etc but i'm just trying to say that here by that rea was already learning a lot in the sense that how they were taking a few things from for granted from the very beginning in terms of the local community responses or um, local county responses and because for them it was like when we did our initial sessions nobody really uh, had any opposition, nobody had a negative point to say, everybody was in favor of this project. They saw that they, this will bring more industries. And 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 for the individuals, the uh, I feel it stretched because, I mean, it stretched the overall bargaining power at the local level because they could influence what kind of activities would take shape on the ground. Uh, they could influence uh, actually set they, they actually set up this full committee and representation from the, these three villages that were uh, that this land entailed so um, i mean so the the outcomes in this case which we also capture in another paper has that mix of both positive and uh, some which are which could have been improved had rea already incorporated some more domestic institutions or in thought of local content a bit more actively uh, and and I agree, and the whole idea was to not work with this continuous binary of losers lose and winners win, because the interesting 
aspect was when you get into intricacies is to see how the losers also kind of so-called losers also tend to have their own ways of pushback, their own ways of stretching the negotiation power, their own ways of um, muddling their way through and reaching out to so-and-so person to make their voices heard. And there are obviously still layers of hierarchy within that as well, in terms of whose voices are being um, uh, raised or heard. And how they are facilitated I mean, there was a lot of uh, very limited access I could get to the communities, the local county, the local committee representatives. So it was a very short window period where I had this one discussion with the local county and the local committee. Uh, though I, I engaged or I spoke very closely to the Rea liaison manager. And the interesting part was every stage was a surprise for them. And this liaison manager is a communications officer who's sent on the ground to fix this. And he is basically figuring it out how to keep different parties happy, but at the same time work with the budget restrictions, et cetera, et cetera. So it mostly the the way was to just have an open communication. I think the main thing missing was to not even have a Swahili speaking representative on the ground um, and to just reassure that the DPC budget that was supposed to be used for the development activities is still the plan uh, and just keep the communication flow open. Yeah. Yes, that's great. Um, thank you, Lakshmi. So let's now okay. move on. Uh, to uh, questions from the floor and also a reminder to participants, feel free to post your questions in the Q&A function. Um, and also um, Urik and Mark, uh, please feel free to jump in if you have additional comments on the questions. So uh, a, a first question um, from Suyash Jolly, who really enjoyed your presentation. Um, he, he or she basically asked that uh, which kind of conceptual approaches uh, would be suitable to make the energy transitions process more equitable with minimum negative impact on local ecology and health of the people from the examples that you have just given. Um, so do we need to move beyond using social technical transitions literature and probably engage with, for instance, social ecological literature to deal with this increasing uh, uh, negative health impacts of electronic waste, uh, renewable energy technologies, land use change, and other kinds of negative uh, impact on local livelihoods. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Sean, and thanks, Suyash, uh, for the question. <laughs> I guess it's a, it's a very big question. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure I can really respond to it in the short time, but I mean, I, I don't think there's necessarily a need to move away from the literature and approaches we already have or to recreate and come up with new. I think the social te technical transitions and within that, whether it's the way agency politics um, has been used or um, institutional work. I mean, I think I think I see that there are many, many frameworks already in place and, and obviously more engagement with the developmental literature um, would help to understand some of these so-called intended and unintended consequences of these transition projects and transition processes overall. Um, I mean, when, just to give an, as an, an example, when we looked at this whole concept of co developmental co-benefits in the World Development Paper with uh, Rasmus Lima, and, and it was very difficult to really get to a point of, you know, what's the minimum and what's the maximum? I mean, what's the ideal scenario? And the ideal scenario differs a lot in each case, in each kind of project setup, in each kind of locality, because the baseline is very different. And, and there's always this spectrum of what is good. I mean, is 100% local labor great? Is it... Um, no environmental impacts great or is it some e-waste okay i mean there are there's so much of subjectivity in this and there's so much of um, also normativity in this that um, yeah it's, um, it's it's difficult to answer this question i suppose <laughs> i don't know Ulrich, if you have more to say here <laughs> thank you uh 
Yes, I'm, one thing I'm, think, I'm thinking about that that's also regarding the, the, the third question on the role of, of NGOs in this. And in, I think it, it could be interesting to explore opportunities to draw another perspective. And here I'm also thinking about Mark's comment about the multinationals. So uh, it would be interesting, I think, for example, to pursue some combination, for example, where you look at um, uh, uh, how these multinationals operate in developing countries. Uh, so this could be done through, for example, a, a, a value chain perspective where you would focus on, on the role of, of lead firms and, and how they operate. Um, and there is a, there's a, there's a lot of the theoretical uh, literature about that. Um, and that could be, I think, very interesting to combine that somehow with, with the, the you know, perspectives from the transition literature. Uh, and in this case, it would be uh, relatively logical, I would say, to, to pursue that going forward. And, and similarly, when we're talking about uh, NGOs or donors coming in from, from the outside to use perspective that are actually available in the, in the larger development literature and, and see if, if we could combine that somehow, I think that would be very interesting. Mm -hmm. So I think this is uh, related to uh, the question by Hui Wen Gong, uh, who also really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, so she basically asked, um, from your uh, research, um, did you find any further insights on the role of these NGOs? And did they sort of put some pressures on the Chinese, uh, on how the Chinese should be doing businesses in Africa? And do they influence in any way the sino local interactions? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, outside of uh, the renewable energy, I mean, obviously there has always been this very large uh, focus on the Sino-China interaction, uh, sorry, Sino-African uh, interactions. And there has obviously been a lot of focus on the various safeguards in this project and the fact that there have been many human rights issues raised. Um, so yes, I mean, the, 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 historically, there's there's been a lot that's being done by the international NGOs to indicate discrimination, discriminatory patterns or exploitative patterns of specific Chinese engagement in the businesses. Uh, but the idea, I mean, but there was also less, I mean, there has, if, if one looks into specific case studies, then one finds examples or, or opposite examples of that. I mean, uh, and now, if uh, I may mention that the Chinese Exim Bank also has the minimum criteria of doing environmental and social impact assessments as part of the loan disbursement process, which a lot of international funders also have, but obviously there is still relatively less scrutiny uh, uh, in the safeguards and how uh, the processes unfold on the ground. So I won't, I won't say there is necessarily a new set of factors specifically for renewable energy projects per se, but overall Chinese engagement in the African countries has it, attracted a lot of attention, mostly of the negative kinds, of course. Yes, great. Um, we have another big question coming up by uh, Matthias Ramirez. Um, he asked, um, in a similar way to past investments of colonial countries that we have learned, um, to what extent do you think that Chinese investments uh, create institutions in Africa that mirror those of um, China? Um, might this be a better or worse fit than, for example, Western infrastructure investments? Yeah, I mean, if you it, if you ask the African governments, they would obviously put it in a very positive light that uh, these investments, as I mentioned, that these investments come with the no strings attached. So there's less interventions with the ideas of democracy and principles and uh, how African governments and countries should govern their own countries. I mean, there's there's. Uh, there's a lot of free hand, according to the African governments, when it comes to Chinese loans or Chinese investments. Um, and uh, for for them, they portray it as a better than the uh, Western infrastructure investments. Um, and, and I guess there's this appreciation for uh, concessional loans, very long term periods, relatively lower interest rate. But when you look at uh, the fact that all of that has meant 
heavy debts and heavy accumulation of loans for specific African governments and especially for Kenya, which is among the highest in terms of the debt that it has accumulated um, as part of the Chinese um, uh, engagement. And uh, there are obviously a lot of uh, political repercussions of that um, as a result. So. I guess it depends on who you're asking this question in terms of whether it's a better or a worse fit. Um, and um, um, yeah, and as I said, Western infrastructure investment, more importantly, financing comes with a lot of scrutiny, a lot of monitoring, a lot of safeguards, uh, a lot more evolved safeguards, um, I would say. Great, um, thank you. So perhaps um, as a last question, uh, um, which I would uh, pose to Lakshmi as well as Mark, perhaps you can wrap it up in a, a sentence of what you think. So basically we saw that there has been a lot of, um, um, in, in the past, this Western uh, influences leading to um, some sort of a, a developmental gaps that we are still witnessing until today. But then uh, with increasing emergence of um, 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 power from uh, the, the Chinese, for instance, um, uh, we are sort of seeing another wave of this uh, uh, influence from the rising power of China, but then within uh, uh, Global South itself. So what do you think the ma major challenges uh, ahead when it comes to really dealing with development issues? Um, well, I think I, th I think we're we're all uh, across, especially the eastern and southern Africa. We're 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 confronting the the ripple effects of the Belt and Road Initiative, and um, and that if that continue, you know, in the in the northern part of our country, there's a massive Chinese uh, sponsored. SEZ that's being promoted with a 2,500 megawatt coal-fired power plant and about 12 heavy industries, and which is which is going to require the the cutting back of 100,000 baobab trees, and that's triggering a social a powerful social movement. And I think it's this combination of social movement activism that contests on the one hand, at the same time. Uh, government policies that are much more constructive in engaging with the kind of institutional work by intermediaries and interlocutors that uh, allow for the articulation of African alternatives. Uh, in a, in a, w a rejectionism on its own is not going to succeed. Uh, that has to be much more contestation um, with with a much much more solid. Uh, investment in, in African alternatives. Thank you, thank you. And if Lakshmi or Uri can have another wrapping sen sentence, yeah. Yeah, I, I also wanted to add to what Mark said. I mean, the other thing that we don't know about when we talk about these projects is what really goes on in behind the scenes meta deals, because a lot of these deals that are happening are very aggregated deals. I mean, it's a combination of railway along with a renewable energy project, along with a hydro project or something. So the terms are set at a much, much higher level. But the thing that a lot of uh, African governments need to kind of, I mean, they are realizing it and they see that there is the scope still for negotiation and to expand their bargaining power. And, and, and this whole view of they are always the passive recipients of this deal is is not entirely true. I mean, it's a fact that at the local level, they still have a lot of influence in engaging, if not anything, at least in some skill building processes, utilizing this opportunity to uh, connecting with do domestic suppliers, domestic NGOs, domestic uh, vocational training institutes, using it as a platform to still uh, kind of identifying how linkages can still be created that could have like a far reaching impact in the long term. And there is no way to, uh, even if there is a lot of criticism around the Chinese uh, renewable energy projects or Chinese projects in general, if you actually look at any other project, I mean, I have also looked at uh, similar scaled or slightly smaller scaled projects in Uganda. At times, there may not be a very significant difference, even if the EPC is 
kind of segregated across different development partners. So kind of ultimately just pulling one actor down completely or rejecting it and calling them uh, fully negative or the fact that the implications are not necessarily fully negative or when you then zoom in, you will see different processes that are that have different kinds of consequences means that it's your focus needs to be more on how you can expand on those developmental co-benefits and how you can expand on that negotiating power uh, and and uh, have more local content into this but i'll pass it on to ulrich if you have more to add great um great i think we have very good discussions today and we are probably just scratching the surface of these developmental challenges uh, uh, in the new generation perhaps um, and and i guess uh, most likely geography of transitions could offer quite a unique lens um, through its spatial global local perspective to deal with this. So we welcome everyone to continue this conversation and discussing this topic um, into the future. With that, um, I would like to close the session. Let me once again thank our speakers, Lakshmi, Urik and uh, Mark for joining us and for the questions from the floor. We will see you again uh, for the next webinar next week, same time. So have a good day or good Thanks evening or good afternoon. Yes. Bye bye.